Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our third Fascinating Webinar, My People, Our Friends, Family and Society, where we'll be exploring how mental health extends beyond ourselves, but also intertwines with the people that surround us, um, including our relationships and our communities. And you can look forward to some wonderful stories and advice from our esteemed panelists later. So do sit back, relax and enjoy the session. Before we begin, here are some housekeeping items. We aim to finish this session within the hour and the last portion of our session will be dedicated to Q&A. So if you do have any questions or if you wanna share your own experience or thoughts about what we'll be talking um, about later, please note it down somewhere and save it till the end of the session because we would love to hear from you. And lastly, please feel free to turn on your videos throughout the session. We'd really be encouraged to have some faces on our screens and do keep your mics muted unless you are speaking. So just a little bit of introduction for myself. My name is Rachel, and I am currently an undergraduate in psychology at Help University. I'm also a committee member for My Mind on Film, and I will be your MC for today. So if you aren't already familiar with My Mind on Film, it is basically a Malaysian film festival for youth and young adults. And this project is really central to the Center of Mental Health and Wellbeing's commitment to engage with young people, to hear them out, and to work together for progress. If you're interested to know more about this, whether it's My Mind on Film or the Center of Mental Health and Wellbeing, do check out our website, um, which you will find in the chat, and you'll be able to find details about this project, our social media pages, and resources available, such as the guideline for make filmmakers who are interested in our ongoing film competition, or safeguarding policies for this project. Now, without further ado, let me introduce our panelists for today. We are truly honored to have Her Royal Highness Tunku Putri Iman Afsan and Professor Dato Dr. Andrew Mohanraj to co-host our panel discussion later. Her Royal Highness Tunku Putri Iman Afsan is appointed as the International Patron of World Mental Health Day 2020. As the International Patron, Her Royal Highness has called on people and governments to come together to invest in mental health and to take on this shared responsibility. Her Royal Highness's appointment as the international patron is also a testament to Malaysia's efforts towards raising awareness on mental health, its treatments, and policy changes. And we can be sure to look forward to some great initiatives and great changes to come in the coming year. Now, of course, among our other esteemed um, positions, Professor Dato Dr. Andrew Muharraj, President of the Malaysian Mental Health Association and a board member of the World Federation for Mental Health, Dato Dr. Andrew has done pioneering work in countries such as Indonesia, the Philippines, and Timor Leste, providing mental health services in the aftermath of natural disasters. As for our guest panelists, we have Dato Bindi Rajasegaran, who has been a Rotarian for over two decades and is currently the Rotary District Governor elect. Dato Bindi is also a driving force in the coordination of the National Coalition for Mental Health initiatives to improve understanding and resources at a societal level. We also have with us Dr. Kor Sui King. Dr. Kor is a Malaysian physician with international experience in public, private, nonprofit, academic, and think tank sectors across 90 countries. He specializes in health policies and global health, holding visiting fellowships at the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health, and ISIS Malaysia. And of course, last but not least, we have Darren Leong. Darren is currently an undergraduate in economics at University College London. He is also a committee member of the UK Malaysian Student Film Festival, which is actually My Mind on Film's collaborating partner to bring together experiences and ideas around mental health. So there you have it, our wonderful panelists from today, and I hope you're equally as pumped to hear from them as well. Now, before we dive in into our panel discussion, I actually have a couple of questions for our co-hosts, for Her Royal Highness Dr. Putri Iman Afsan and Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Andrew. So, Your Royal Highness, a few weeks ago, you were kind enough to reach out to students here in Malaysia and in the UK to talk about how we as students are coping, how we're adapting, especially in the pandemic right now, and about mental health in our generation in general. One thing that really impressed me most was when you brought up um, how different members of our families are worrying about the pandemic, how we're adapting to it, how we're coping with it. Um, and it made me realize the universality of family bonds, mm -hmm. how we're there for each other in times, uh, be it good or bad. 
Uh, and how we also share this collective human experience. So as an advocate for mental health and as the international patron of World Mental Health Day 2020, um, as well as a wife, a sister, mother, what do you think is the most important thing for families around mental health? This could be how they relate to one another, the sort of values or habits they try to cultivate, um, their wider aspirations or anything at all. Okay, I'm going. So yeah, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you all. And um, yeah, thank you to My Mind on Film for having me here today as a co-host. Um, I had a really good time during that webinar that we had um, with the students from Health Uni and from all over. Um, yeah, I think this is a really important question um, because there are so much that families can do around mental health, you know, to better their approach. I feel like sometimes it's, it, I think breaking the stigma starts at home, you know, more than anything. So yeah, um, firstly, I think it's so important for families to be empathetic and understanding to one another. Um, just to not, you know, shut, be, be so quick to be dismissive or, you know, um, judgmental, but to just be there and just to know, I think just to know that um, my family members are just there for me, no matter what really helps. So yeah, just the importance of just being present with your family members, you know, because nowadays it's like, we're always so connected and, you know, we don't have that really moment to kind of bond. So I feel like those bonds are so important. And yeah, I just think empathy is important. Being understanding is important, um, especially around mental health. I think that um, to be open-minded about, you know, let's just say someone has, you know, a family member has anxiety or depression. I think having that open-mindedness will help, will help with the empathy mm -hmm. and not to be so, if you're more dismissive, the more less empathetic you'll be. So it's kind of like, you know, so it's important to just show them your support, especially because I feel like family is the first point, first place, you know, not, you know, not everyone is fortunate enough to, to have that, but for the ones who, who are, you know, I think that being understanding and supportive and just to show your unconditional love is like, means a lot more than yeah. anything. And yeah, I think that also for families, um, uh, um, for families, I think it's important for them to, to keep educated about mental health because some people want to support their, their loved one going through something, but they can't yeah. because they're not educated. So perhaps it's time to just maybe educate families. You know, I'm going to try get into that, you know, to educate parents about how to support their child who's maybe going through something. Um, so yeah, I think that educating is important and to cultivate that awareness around you know, various mental health problems, you know, just to, to help them help both the, I mean, the person going through it and the family member realize their symptoms faster, like, oh my gosh, I think you have slight depression or, you know, so it's, it's a two way thing because yeah. we, you know, let's say the person going through anxiety is suffering, but what, what's, they can only do so much, but if they don't have the support from their family, they can't really, you know, it's just doesn't, it's not very nice for them, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's important to support them and to communicate. I think communicating within in families is something we always find is not that easy. I think, it's, you know, sometimes you want to say something to your parents, but you don't, you feel like you can't. But I think when there's com more communication, the more better, mm -hmm. you know, they, we can go about things. So yeah, I think that's important. And just to reach out, to be able to reach out to your parents or for help, you know, or the parents to reach out to, you know, the children and just communication and support, I think is so important. Yeah. Yeah. So that's you. why I think it's important for families to know. Um, yeah, that's true. Thank you so much, Your Highness. And mm. I think it starts from within us having that sort of empathy and that understanding yeah. and of course educating ourselves and you know the people around us with the understanding and having that awareness yeah and I think that helps build the communication and cultivate that sort of healthy relationship as well open-mindedness as well 
Yes. Yeah. Being being the open. Stigma, bring the stigma starts at home. Yeah. Precisely. Yes. And and speaking of support, um, Dr. Andrew, you've done inspiring work on community mental health where people, families, and societies are experiencing devastation and trauma. Could you say a little bit about what we as groups of people can or should do when we're under a particular strain? Um, and this could be the universal strain that we're all going through right now, such as the pandemic, or it could be more acute experiences such as you know, unexpected loss of, loss of a loved one, mm. um, displacement, loss of income, related family back, breakdowns. Thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Rachel. Um, you know, the, for the last 15 years or so, I've been, as, as you said, uh, in your you know, you very kindly introduced in your kind introduction um, that I've been involved in humanitarian work in the region. And I find this crisis now, this pandemic, in, in many ways worse than, than a humanitarian crisis that I've been involved in for many years, simply because although in a humanitarian crisis, there's great psychological decompensation, uh, and 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 particularly now with this COVID thing, uh, superimposed on some of the humanitarian crisis that you find in the world, obviously uh, it also affects the access to healthcare, food supplies, medical supplies, and all that. But the the interesting thing in my my finding is that in no usual humanitarian crisis, particularly if it's a, a natural a post national na natural disaster you would find that people are reconciled to the fact that it is time limited and there is something to, to, to look forward to uh, and, and to know what is to, to be expected. However, in this pandemic, the uncertainty of it, and of course now there's talk of vaccine and there's a lot of hope, but otherwise there's a lot of uncertainty as far as the transmission of the virus and the do's and don'ts and how long this is going to last and whether there's going to be a mutation of the virus that will render the vaccine uh, not effective and things like this. So I think the uncertainty of it is going to have long-term implications, mental health implications. And probably we will see some sort of improvement only when the vaccine is uh, available and distributed uh, uh, you know, uniformly. Uh, uh, particularly for the vulnerable groups, and this is this is what I see, uh, and and from the findings of MMHA uh, in this pandemic, I think the main uh, causes of of mental health issues or psychological decompensation, the way we see it, is uh, is being affected by interpersonal relationships, or the cause of it itself is the friction in an interpersonal relationship. And as you mentioned, the loss of a loved one. Uh, and what is more interesting also is the fact that we see a significant uh, decompensation among first line workers who are, have to uh, put up with uh, you know, some discriminatory practices against them on the stigma that they face being the frontline workers, being rejected by their family members uh, and then, of course, the, the people who are afraid of the potential loss of income or those who have already lost income as a result of this pandemic. Um, university students have been you know, justifiably upset, uh, thinking that their, their, you know, the educational opportunities may be uh, lost. And also, in cases of deaths, as you mentioned just now, it's, I mean, I think most of us uh, do understand, do accept death uh, and, and, and the fact that people have to die. But in these circumstances, it's very unique that although one can actually accept that, but the process of mourning, of grieving, of organizing a funeral, of having family support uh, in these moments, these, are, these have been great challenges that people have faced. And that's what makes this pandemic so, so unique and, and, and different in the sense that there are many things that we can do within our own cultures um, to, to, to bring about a certain closure, for example. Uh, we are unable to do that here, uh, you know, and, and, and that's, I can tell you for, from my own, not my personal experience, that, but my, my family while I was away, my mother was not able to attend 
the funeral of an uncle. And that actually caused a little bit of friction within the family. Um, and there was also that, that, that you know, the, the, the whole process of grieving and coming to a closure was also uh, affected as a result of that. But I do see a silver lining in all this, in the sense that for sure we know that there's a greater acceptance now in the short period of time, we have found greater acceptance to mental health uh, issues, there's a greater awareness and the feeling that there's a need to do something about it. And people recognize that no one is spared in this, um, you know, and, and my own wish is that any mental health intervention will see greater space in, 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 in the primary care uh, sector, as well as community involvement, uh, creating resilience, um, not just hoping on the private sector to rise to the occasion. And I'm sure SK later might have uh, more to say about this. And one thing, again, that we are fully aware is that this virus doesn't discriminate. It just, it, you know, it hits anybody. And we are all part, we are equally vulnerable. And therefore, I think every one of us have got a, 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 you know, a role to play here to ensure that the whole community uh, benefits from, from what we can do beyond uh, this pandemic. I also think as Malaysians, you know, we we are justifiably be, be proud of our food. And that's right. I mean, everywhere in the world, when you go and you say you're from Malaysia, people say, ah, oh, the food, the divine food, things like that. And But I do hope that while we are so proud of our food, but we have to really stop eating chendol uh, on top of the longkang. And, you know, this kind of things have to really, and this, this pandemic sometimes will probably come, will, will give a realization to us that this is, this is a time that we need to really clean up the mess and start thinking not only of public health and, and also inculcate certain personal, uh, you know, hygienic practices and things like that in our life. Um, and and that's that's another thing that this lesson, can, this pandemic can can you know result in, as well as as preparing us for another pandemic. Hopefully, uh, you know, we don't face another pandemic of any kind, but this could be uh, a, a lesson for us as to how to prepare ourselves. So finally, you know, I'm, I'm beating around the bush a little bit. You did ask me that question as to what we can do as individuals and, and groups. There are lots of things that we can do and I've made some notes of this, some points, but uh, you know, some of the things that are very crucial here as uh, Her Royal Highness has mentioned just now, really crucial is to show solidarity and care for others. This can make a real big difference in this particular uh, moment that we are, you know, facing, going through simple things, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, 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 gestures of reaching out to people, just texting them to say, how are you? Or, you know, just following it up with a, with a phone call uh, to, to people can be really useful. And personally, I must say this during this pandemic, I have found myself reaching out to people that I would not normally even bother to say hello. And these are people on my, you know, this long list of friends on the Facebook. And I don't even know who these are, these people are. And sometimes you have not spoken to them for three or four years. So this is an opportunity. I think this pandemic has taught me how important it is to, to appreciate human relationships and friends and 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 uh, and the and the role that they play in our lives and not to take friendship and people for granted another thing that we can do is to ensure that we help spread uh, you know correct information about the pandemic and and don't uh, be tempted to spread information that we think is not reliable um, and this, there's been a lot of this misinformation going around the place, and I think we need to exercise some restraint in that. Some other things that some of my friends have done also is using this opportunity to enhance their educational capacity or their, you know, the ability to be more more competitive in the job market, for example. So this is the best time that they have to to do that. Um, and another lesson that. I have less learned as well, and I'm sure most of us know, is the fact that this pandemic has taught us that we are in a consumerist culture. And it's interesting that people have realized that they can get by with so little, actually. So all this while we have been just buying things, hoarding and doing whatever 
you know uh, that 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 really uh, we don't really have to spend that kind of money uh, to continue living a, a satisfied uh, um, life the one final point that i would like to make is and this is adding on to what tanku putri always um, uh, talks about that's workplace mental health this pandemic has also resulted in uh, you know issues of workplace mental health and uh, uh, this is the, there are two categories here people who are working from home this seems to be the new norm but what is forgotten is that people from home working from home also face issues in fact it is many people working from home have complained they've said that because they're working from home their bosses seem to think that they can be contacted any time of the day and they expect an immediate uh, reply uh, you know and 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 so they're being sort of like abu- uh, exploited because they're working from home they don't know how to di- distinguish between you know uh, uh, the, the time allotted for their children or, or chores uh, related to the to the house or mm-hmm. or to 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 the job so so that that inability to distinguish and and or be clear about the time is also another issue and when people are psychologically decompensated how are you going to detect that as supervisors as managers because they're working from home mm-hmm. you got to read in between the lines and their curt email replies or the tone of the voice you know and and so this is this becomes the silent sufferers here people in the workplace on the other hand also suffer because of the new arrangement uh, social distancing and things like that um you know so i mean i can go on and on on that i'm not going to to discuss too much of it but finally i think what amazes me in this whole thing before i close is the fact that technology has been simply amazing with the technology available i think we have really uh, improved leaps and bounds to reach out to people and appreciate another human being in our lives thank you thank you so much dr andrew yes that that's really really insightful and there's so many things that we can do as communities and i'm i'm glad that you also brought up how we as communities should also step up and that's where um without any further ado i'll i'll hand it over to our co-host today which is um her royal highness tanku putri iman and dr andrew to moderate and to go ahead with our panel discussion so over to you okay so um i'm going to start with my question with this question for Dr. Bindi um Dr. Bindi can you please could you please could you say a little about how organizations like Rotary play a role in supporting mental health at a community national and perhaps even at international level what are the advantages of working as a group rather than each of us doing our own thing thank you so much your royal highness for that question um good afternoon to everyone now uh, rotary is a very unique organization in that um there are no borders in what we do except that we are apolitical and non-religious however we do have our seven areas of focus which are all in line with the united nations sdgs and um they are concentrating on the areas of water and sanitation mothers health and children education growing economies pro- uh, economies um protecting the environment disease and promoting peace and allow me to say here in this area of promoting peace um we sponsor fully sponsor 150 students on a worldwide basis to do their masters program in peace and conflict resolution in seven mm. partner universities in the world so the range of things that we do is immense having said that the main undertaking of rotary international is the eradication of polio and we have taken this course since 1979 and from an annual number of polio victims of 350000 mm. we have brought this figure down to less than 100 and the mm. success has been due to working with other organizations like WHO UNICEF CDC Gavi and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation So similarly coming to the subject of mental well-being we all know it's a very complex agenda and we have come to realize that there are many NGOs associations and stakeholders who are doing excellent work on their own initiative within their capabilities 
And our government has also in place many measures, including the Mentari clinics and Talian Kase hotline and many more programs. However, we all know that with the recent National Health and Morbidity, Morbidity Survey shows that we remain off track in impact and much is needed to be done in this area as there are close to half a million children affected by anxiety, depression and stress. And the suicide rate is increasing within the 15 to 29 age group. And the statistics have doubled or even tripled in the last six months of the pandemic. So one possible solution would be to take an integrated approach to create the transformation that can achieve results with greater coherence from government, business, civil society, and all the st stakeholders in this field to operationalize such a complex agenda. And we must come together. We must use our collective expertise to implement programs that are structured, sustainable, and impactful. And at international level, Mm, we have been researching best practices of other countries in methods that are tried and tested with favorable results. So we are looking into adopting those pr uh, practices into our, our uh, agenda here. Thank you so much, Your Highness. Thank you so much, Dr. Bindi, for that. Yeah, I do agree that, I mean, a collective effort is better than an individual effort. I feel like we'll go farther, further with... Um, working hand in hand. So yeah, I look forward yeah. to that. Okay, so my next question is for SK. Um, doctor, sorry, Dr. SK. Um, <laughs> what can we do as individual citizens to enhance the system around mental health provision for all? How is our local cultural context, things like expectations and conventions, or what we're used to, what we're used to implicated in this? Thank you, thank you, Iman. Um, I'll answer the question very narrowly and only talk about the Malaysian mental health context in two ways. The first one, stigma, and the second one, healthcare or mental health care. Um, and and that, that would be a concept that I'll need to explore just a little bit. But we'll begin with stigma. What can you do, those all of you who are listening in? You are here because you understand very deeply the importance of mental health. And thank you very much for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Mm -hmm. What you can do is to help your friends, your colleagues, your family members. And when you get into positions where you have influence or power or decision-making privileges, that you will help to destigmatize mental health issues. What I mean by destigmatize mental health issues is to essentially make the case that it is okay if you have anxiety, it is okay if occasionally you might feel a little down or depressed, it is okay if you feel, um, well, you, you might uh, feel a little uh, disturbed or your emotions are not so stable, and you must reach out for help if you're not feeling so well from a mental, emotional, and psychological basis. And if you do your part to destigmatize mental health, that will be what uh, we as an all of society can do for our friends, our families, and even total strangers who are going through burdens that are often very, very invisible. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I'll say is we all need to play our part to destigmatize mental health. And this is something that you can do. In fact, you can do this beginning today. And I say this to all the listeners uh, I'm viewing in right now. The second thing that I would say is, uh, as a health policies uh, person and a health systems person, we can train and we should train more psychiatrists, more psychologists, more counsellors. We need to build more clinics, integrate mental health services in primary care clinics, train our 7,000 general practitioners in the private sector in Malaysia about psychological first aid, about how to identify those with mental health issues and suicidal risk and so on. All that is a given and we're all moving in that direction. But remember that we can only train so many psychologists and counsellors and we can only build so many clinics and hospitals and we can only prescribe so many medicines. What we ultimately need to do is to create an environment where people feel healthy from a mental perspective and also physical perspective because even after you discharge them from a hospital, they have to go home to a home that is loving, 
a workplace that is uh, without harassment or bullying or is abusive and to a social and economic environment that allows them to also have a lot of mental health without having to go back to the hospital. So thank you, Iman. In response to your question, I would say there are many things that you as a dear listener can do, which is firstly to destigmatize, and secondly, to broaden our conversation away from just healthcare services towards the non-health and the non-medical aspects of mental health. Thank you. Over to you, thank you, Iman. Absolutely agree. Could not agree more with that because what's the point of training, having everyone trained and, and um, having all the centers and, and you know the psychologists if, if 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 the patient goes back home and is, is back to square one right so yeah again breaking the stigma starts at home i always believe that so and yeah so can i pass it over to uh dr andrew please? yeah thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you Iman. um i would uh, also like to add on to what um uh, Tanku Iman has always uh, mentioned in her capacity as international patron for uh, World Mental Health Day. Uh, and that is consistent with what uh, SK just now mentioned and called for a multi-sectorial approach um, in uh, uh, dealing with um, or, or, or meeting the demands of, of the mental health issues. Um, and, and therefore, I think your statement is absolutely correct for us to depend on one sector alone does not make sense. So what is the point if you had such fantastic services, but only for the client to go back to a very unwelcoming workspace or work environment or a family? My question before I move on to Darren, I would like to just ask one more question. I think we have time for one more question to SK. Now, you know, being a, a, a health systems person, uh, and I would like to take advantage of your presence here and, and get your opinion on this. The fact is that we are so dependent on the formal sector for the government sector to provide services. We have a small minuscule private sector uh, that are providing mental health services, although not complete. Now, and there on top of it, we have an insurance issue in the sense that, you know, the insurance companies do not completely cover mental health issues as well. What do you envisage for our country? What sort of a system should we follow? What sort of a health delivery system can we adapt? Uh, is there any, uh, any country that you have in mind that we could use as a model for this? Very briefly, can you, can you assist us in, in understanding this? Of course, Andrew. Uh, but just to clarify the question, you mean mental health care delivery or health care delivery as a whole? Uh, well, health care delivery in general, but I'm specifically talking about mental health care. And the reason is because in the private sector, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's largely out of pocket uh, when you want to access uh, services because insurance, there's no insurance coverage. So therein lies a peculiar challenge for mental health services. Andrew, thank you. Um, I'll make maybe two comments if I can over here, just uh, very briefly in a space of a minute and a half maybe, and then return the floor over to you. Um, there are yeah. two models that we can learn from specific to mental health care delivery in other countries. The first model is um, not first model, but rather the first set of comments I'll make is regarding economic incentives. And if there is something that we can do in Malaysia to kickstart uh, ins private insurance coverage for mental health care and begin with large companies. I'm inventing Petronas, Tanaga National, the multinational companies uh, as a whole would cover quite a large sizable number of population and then you can use that to leverage um, to have more, um, say, private insurance to cover mm. mental health as part of their benefits package. And once that is done, uh, you will see that uh, uh, there will be a demand for services and then the supply will come out to um, provide the mental health care in the private side, also in the community-led services. So I will say begin with some economic incentives and one way to begin is with mm. private health insurance coverage and expanding that to include mental health in the benefits package. That's my first set of comments. Andrew, in many other countries, uh, mental health services, and frankly, I think you're more expert in this than I am, mental health services are, um, are contracted by a single payer and many OECD countries have this single-payer model. Yeah. What single-payer means is that there is one agency, usually a government-run agency, that's publicly owned and non-profit that purchases healthcare services. Let me invent the example of South Korea, for example. 
Um, there is one agency, the Korean Insurance Agency, that purchases services and negotiates uh, the services in bulk, therefore driving costs down. Um, Malaysia might not have such a central purchaser of services uh, yet, uh, but the, the, the point I'm making is that uh, it, um, the multiple purchases of services for Malaysia uh, can utilize the model that is used in other countries and is community mental health mm -hmm. services. Rather than, um, say, a network of general practitioner clinics or specialized counselors and specialized psychiatrists, which is important, absolutely Malaysia needs to have more psychiatrists, more counselors, more psychologists per capita, we also need a lot of uh, people in the community that can um, funnel these patients up and refer upwards and refer downwards, uh, then it becomes necessary. So those are my two sets of comments, Andrew. Mm. Firstly, economic incentives through insurance. Secondly, community-led mental health services, which have been proven, I think, in some small studies uh, to be very effective and very inclusive as well. Sorry for my mm. monologue, Andrew, over to you. No, no, not at all. It's very interesting and and, and it's, uh, you know, very relevant comments that you make. And I think we are at the crossroads now in our country to you know, where we are thinking what should be the way forward in trying to provide a very comprehensive service um, health delivery system. So with that, thank you very much, SK. And we'll move on to Darren. Um, you know, Darren, I'm, you being in the UK now, and, uh, you know, obviously you, you have, you're probably exposed to different cultural attitudes towards mental health. Um, I would, like you to tell us uh, what do you think of your personal your exposure in the UK and and what advice would you like to give students aspiring to go abroad what are the kind of challenges they might expect um, in an environment that you are in hey thanks Andrew I'm sure I hope you guys can hear me properly also I think in terms of like exposure to the UK maybe from a mental health perspective um, I think I can I can definitely tell that it is less stigmatized here in the UK, um, not just like the people I meet, but also the support from my university has also um, been more available and more accessible. I think just about two weeks ago, I was just doing some work for my uni. I was just studying, and suddenly I got a I got a call from my uni. They said they were from UCL, and I was like, hi. And they said, oh, we're from UCL Mental Health, Mental Wellbeing and Support. And they just wanted to talk to me about how my day was going and wanted to talk mm. to me about how I was coping with university work. And it ended up being about a seven to 10 minute conversation about anxiety, um, depression, my mm. mental health. And it ended with them telling me, so these are the list of services that are available and you know how to reach us. And if there's anything, just please reach out to us. Please do give us a call. And I think in terms of that the exposure i got was that it is a lot more it is a lot more like important and less stigmatized less stigmatized here and that you know these services are more accessible um then for the second question in terms of advice that i can give for students aspiring to study in the uk um i do think that just advice for students in general is that when you do study or when you do do your work um i think it's very important to go at your own pace um, it's very normal for students to feel like they are feel like they are very behind when they compete with their other peers as well. It's very normal to feel like you may not be doing enough, but it's also very important to know that you are essentially competing against yourself. And some days it might feel like you are not doing enough, but mm. it's okay because they have their own they have their own path and you have your own timeline as well. So mm. when doing your work, make sure you just follow your own pace. Okay. Um, and yeah, if you are aspiring to study in the UK, um, I've, al I've always feel and I still feel today like that in itself is a privilege because in order to be, in order to access the exams and the courses which allow you to study and apply to the UK, you do need to be able to um, have, 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 have the financial needs to access A-levels or um, mm specific foundation courses. So if you are looking to study in the UK, do look at A-levels, do look at um, uh, these other foundation courses as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, coming back to the, your earlier, you know, your, your, your comments about how you found the phone call so useful to you from your university asking how you're doing. Uh, did you not feel or have any hesitation about about revealing a lot about how you feel uh, just 
from a random phone call like that do you think that that's that's an issue um yeah i i i do think like for 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 many people it is it is difficult mm. to just um speak about your mental health speak about your anxiety mm. especially if it's even just through a stranger on a phone call um yeah. i think i'm i'm someone that has um thankfully like has less difficulty in expressing that um okay but it was already very helpful and nice to know that okay your uni is behind you there are systems and there is there is support there if you ever need it yeah yeah and you felt safe talking about uh, you know matters concerning mental health on the phone see, like personally personally okay. for me like i personally for me i did feel safe but i know that i cannot speak for everyone here sure. okay okay darren before i let you go I just want one more comment from you. Uh, mm. During this pandemic, there are many students in Malaysia, many who aspired to go overseas, not only to the UK but other countries as well. But somehow, because of the pandemic, all their plans were put aside for some time. Many feared that they couldn't even, you know, continue in, in or pursue that same pathway because the universities might not no longer offer them the positions and things like that. Uh, and and naturally. Uh, these students felt very disappointed and some of them uh, uh, became depressed and anxious about their future what would be your advice to those who have had their educational plans stalled wow um wow 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 in, in terms of that like i, I think <laughs> like the first thing first thing i i have is so so much sympathy for them because all these yeah. things are I I think I would just want to reassure them that you know all these things have all these things are very sad because it is not in their control it is literally mm-hmm. because of the pandemic it's nothing they can do about it and well I in terms of advice I want to give I would just try to reassure them that it is not their fault and mm. because there is a hurdle here yeah. it also does not mean that this is the end of the world absolutely because i know that i know that it can be very i know that it can be very common to sort of blame yourself for not being able to um mm-hmm. do this or not being able to pursue your studies because of this but true, true. and also maybe it's good to take a healthy view of this as well and say that you know like you're taking a, a year off and pursuing something else maybe getting a job or you know ex- exposing yourself to a completely different field all to all together uh, before you then you know get back to to that pathway that you intended to to pursue because this might be a sort of a conflict of cultures really because in the western culture it might be completely normal to take a year or two off and do whatever that you have to do but somehow in our culture it's like you know become a nuclear scientist at the age of 12 and uh, right. something right. like that so anyway thank you very much darren that's uh, very interesting so i think you, over to you rachel Yes. Oh, I don't know if Tanku Putri would like to ask something as well. Uh, oh. oh, sorry. Uh, Your Royal Highness, you're on mute. <laughs> is it over? Is it? Sorry, I don't know whose turn it is to speak. Uh, because of the interest of time, um, I think we'll move on with the Q&A session. If there's okay. nothing else right. from the panel and from both of you as well. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. All right. Awesome. All right. So thank so you so ended. much. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Your Highness, Dr. Andrew, for co-hosting it, and for the panelists. I mean, we we get so many perspectives from a systematic level, mm-hmm. um, both how we can learn from international uh, policies and how we can apply that here locally, and how we can learn from locally as well, and from Darren, you know, advice and perspectives as a student to a student as well. I think that's really helpful. Um, now, of course, we don't want to stop here. Um, we also want to hear what. you guys think as well from the audiences from the participants so oh. if you do have any questions um we're now opening the time and the floor for questions from all of you um please feel free to type it into the chat if you like to or if you want to speak up please feel free to just unmute your mics and direct your questions um or if you just want to share your experiences or your thoughts on what we've talked about earlier please feel free to uh just share with us so you may feel free to just direct them I think I saw a question here. Somebody typed out a question. Was it Rita? 
but it yes. wasn't complete. It just appeared for a short while on the screen. Um, oh. So we have the question. Can we, like, can we, sorry, just can we set limits to the time of the answers? If not, we can just, we, it will never, you know, sometimes it just doesn't end. So let's just, you know, so that as many, we can take as many questions. Yep, mm. definitely. Thank you so much, Your Highness. So we'll probably have like a minute or two on each question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have one from Yvonne. Um, I would like to ask how prepared do all the speakers think or feel Malaysia is in implementing policies in an attempt to break those mental health stigma? So I'll open this for any of our panelists. Um, Dr. SK, would you like to chip in on that? Sure, I'll, I'll get started and get, get the ball rolling in less than a minute, Rachel. Um, thank you, Yvonne, for your okay. question. Malaysia is prepared but not prepared. Um, as with many things in a complex health system, which is very large, some parts of it are very prepared, like the people in the non-communicable diseases section, those who are already working in the psychiatric or mental health services. These people are raring to go. They've got plans already. Um, but uh, parts of the system are also unprepared. Unprepared in the sense that we're dealing with COVID, we're dealing with a surge of diabetes, we're dealing with uh, antenatal and maternal care, also non-citizen health care as well. So the, the point, the general um, sense uh, that I'm getting is that uh, Mental health, although very important, is deprioritized in the universe of priorities. Um, and I think here uh, there is a role for you to play, Yvonne, and everybody else listening in as well. Mental health is as important as all these other health priorities, which means that we need to equalize it, which is not to say that mental health is more important than antenatal care or non-citizen care. I don't think we're able to make that kind of a moral judgment, but at least to equalize the relative weights of importance. That's when you get the people who are, shall we say, less um, fluent or less understanding of mental health to really play the ball, or play, play the game as well, so that we can all uh, do better for mental health. That's a short answer, yes and no, and the analysis for why. Rachel, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Suki. Uh, short and sweet. I hope that answers your question, Yvonne. We have another question from Anthony. His question was, how do we balance deploying resources to dealing with pathology versus programs for developing well-being and flourishing. So would any, uh, would any of our panelists like to take this question? So how do we find a balance for deploying resources to dealing with pathology versus programs for developing well-being um, and flourishing that? I think that's SK's field. <laughs> um, sure. I'll, if it's okay with you, Rachel, and then I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this one. I would love to hear what the other panelists think about yeah. as well. Uh, Anthony, thank you for your question. I will begin with a statistic, then the analysis. The statistic is that in Malaysia, 70% of Ministry of Health's budget, 70% is spent on curative care, which is pathology in Anthony's words. 7%, I repeat, 7%, so one-tenth of it, is spent on preventive care, which is, uh, uh, in Anthony's words, uh, developing well-being and flourishing. Um, so the, the imbalance is roughly the similar in, in rich countries as well, where they approximately spend 75% on curative and about 6 to 7% on preventive as well. Now, let me set aside that statistic and provide a bit of an analysis. Um, for the longest time, we've built hospitals thinking that building a hospital is the best way to deliver healthcare. I agree, it is the best way to deliver healthcare, but not to deliver health. And if you think about delivering health, as opposed to healthcare, then you might spend a billion ringgit developing programs of well-being and flourishing. This requires us to balance these two very difficult and very competing priorities, but perhaps a, a, a bit more of a balance is necessary and that requires us, as in you listening in and you viewing the sessions right now, to be aware that health is so broad and healthcare is only one component of it. Um, Rachel and Anthony, I hope uh, uh, this was a satisfactory answer and over again to Rachel. Definitely. <laughs> um, we, we have some sort of approval from NC as well. Uh, that would be the. Do you have anything to add on? We saw you chipping in a bit. But but I was looking at another question in the chat uh, yes. group. Uh, I think it's from, uh, um, what is that? Abana, who asked, uh, he said, I think a big problem for mental mm -hmm. health care in the Malaysian public schooling system is a lack of accessibility to affordable health care and how can we equip the Malaysian school system with a better health care plan yeah. now that's that's a very uh, complex question that requires a very complex answer but from the point of view of a service organization uh, 
like Rotary, we do provide a lot of assistance where healthcare is concerned for deserving students in school, but we cannot reach everybody. And talking about mental health care, we are going to address that issue on a large scale in schools by uh, training school counsellors. And this is through the efforts of the National Coalition of, yes. uh, for, for Mental Health Initiatives. So we are looking at a very all-rounded program that, mm -hmm. that uh, targets the entire strata of society, not only the school children, but also the parents of these school children. Uh, you know, uh, giving them the support and yeah. also college and university students and also people in the workplace because it's a proven fact that the GDP of the country is directly affected by the loss of working hours of workplace. So mm -hmm. coming back to the question of uh, uh, mental, uh, medical health for the school children, it's, it's, um, it's just as much as we can do, we, we will do. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Binti. I think um, I'm going to take the question from Sarah. Yes. Us. How would you approach and create awareness to people in authority about mental health, especially if they do, do not believe in the existence of mental health issues? Um, I think you'll see a lot from me in 2021. Um, I'm, I'm going to have, um, I'm going to roll out a campaign for mental health and I'm gonna get very, you know, a lot of influential people involved. And I hope that will sort of help to, you know, get, get everyone talking, you know, even more, get the conversation going. Um, and for those in, you're saying in authority who don't believe in the existence of mental health issues, I believe that everyone does believe that they exist. They just don't wanna admit it, you know? So for me, it's like, I'm sure it's just a matter of just accepting that there is an issue because there's, you know, I'm sure everyone is affected by it somehow. No one's perfect, you know, especially not, you know, it's, it's a tough time. So I believe that there's, that, you know, there are other ways to go about it. And I feel like with me joining the National Health Coalition, we're going to, you know, get a lot done and collaborate and to just address so many of these mental health issues, especially with the campaign going and relevant, you know, influencers and, you know, different faces that everyone recognizes, it will help, you know, to get that conversation going. So I, I believe it's just a matter of time before this, this um, perception changes. Yeah, precisely. And we are a work in progress in Malaysia. We are, um, we're all a work in progress, so. Yeah, definitely. But I, I, I'm proud to say that we can at least be at hopeful um, to see some changes. I just believe if we all work together, some, you know, there will be, there will be some form of change. Yeah. Matter of time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Your Royal Highness. Um, and just to check with our co-hosts and our guest panelists, would you all be okay to just fill over for about 10 minutes, just to take on a couple more questions? Sure. Yeah, yeah sure, right. no problem. Awesome. All right, that's great. Also, um, like, I would I would like to just, if, sorry, Rachel, for interrupting. No, no. I would like to just take this question from Yubin. So I'd like to ask what are the challenges students who study locally face um, when they have to accept the fact that they aren't able to pursue their tertiary education overseas? Um, I think this is a, a bit more in my field, I guess. Um, I think, firstly, so I, I really do like um, empathize. It. Like, if, if if someone has always had aspirations to study overseas and they are unable to do so, it can be it can feel like very heartbreaking and stuff. Um, I guess in terms of the challenges, when you come out to work in the workforce, the uh, the credentials on your certificate, the credentials on your graduation um, criteria. You will you will have less of an upper hand, I guess, if you study locally just on paper, right? But I think when you do eventually enter the workforce, I am a strong advocate in believing that um, that is just one aspect of it. But when you do go for your interviews and when you do eventually work, it is your capabilities, it is your experience that come to the forefront. And whether you study locally or whether you study overseas, um, it's, it's different now. Yeah, precisely. And and it's really about your experience, your your perspective on what you take away as well. Right? Yeah. Um, th thank you so much, Darren. Uh, 
there's actually a question from sorry i lost the question i'm trying to find it again <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Andrew. Somebody called Rosli, I think. Yeah, um, Rohi. Uh, she has a question for Tengku Iman. Yes, I have uh, to take this one and then I have to, I'm so sorry I have to, to go because I have a prior engagement. No worries. I'm yes. So sorry after this question. Yes, so, so for Tengku Iman. That as an expat working with international students, it can be difficult to find a balance that suits the culture and traditions of Malaysia. How do we help support the young people without imposing our views to them? There needs to be guidance available, especially post MCO and schools opening up. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think, okay, as an expat, I understand um, how it is difficult to impose one's views on the students because I did study abroad and I do see the a very big difference between the the mental health. I mean, with, with how much mental health has progressed over there as opposed to here. Not that I'm saying Malaysia is like behind or whatever, but of course I feel like the culture, you know, it's we're Asian culture. It's just like, we're just not as, you know, open as, you know, Europe or, but yeah, I feel like there is, it's important to find the balance between imposing and, and I think that, rather than having to impose, it's better to just educate. So I think it's the, the most important thing is to go into the education system and to just, you know, encourage these students to be able to be open and like be more open-minded. So it's a whole, I think it's a whole mindset shift yeah. as opposed to imposing. So I think that, you know, I understand how it's difficult as an expat to have to to know where that line is, but I think that if we, the more we, we are able to talk to our students about mental health and the more we destigmatize, it all starts with destigmatization, I think. Like, the more we were able to talk and, and the more open minded we become, I feel like it would be easier to find that balance, you know, and that create that guide for students. So, yeah. Yeah, I hope that helps answer your question. Awesome. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Nanko Putri. So um, sorry, to leave a bit early. I mean, yes, no worries. It's, it's uh, totally okay. But yeah, it's so nice to see you all. And thank you so much for tuning in, everyone, and to the co-hosts and panelists. Thank you so much. Um, so sorry I have to leave again. No I would love, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one already. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much, Yero. So sorry again. So sorry I've got to go. No worries. Thank, thank you. you. We'll see you again. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so... Adding on to that question earlier um, about how the older generation or how experts or older people can help younger generation in terms of you know, accessing mental health and coping with that. Um, I was thinking if Darren, if you'd be interested to take this on from your perspective as a student as well, um, especially how you brought up getting help from your university and how they approached you. Um, how do you think you as a student or as a younger generation would like to receive help? from others? Um, I think like as a student, um, it can be very difficult to, you might know that you, um, you might know that you need all this uh, mental health help from the universities or uh, from any private healthcare or public healthcare services, but then it can be very difficult to do that even though you acknowledge that you do need the help. Um, how, how a lot of my peers and I, even me also prefer to um, receive this help is through my peers, my friends, my my family, um, because you always feel like you're already comfortable with them, and these are the people that you've known for a long time already, and they understand you so well. So, um, preferably, you do definitely want to be able to have a support system whereby you can um, have mental health support from there, lah. But at the same time, we also have to recognize that um, it is not their obligation nor their responsibility. To, to 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 also deal with your like dysfunction or your issues and that um, like even before you ask them whether you can even before you like you ask them for help even before you ask them whether you can vent or um, talk to them about something it's it's important to just um, make sure that they are in the right frame of mind that they are in the that they have the mental capacity to be able to be there for you mm -hmm. awesome thank you so much Darren. Uh, 
Yeah, so I will just go on with one last question and I'll open this to all of our panelists. And Dr. Andrew, if you would like to chip in as well, please feel free to do so. Um, so we have a question from Derek. He asks, uh, what are your views on how positive psychology and addressing happiness levels would also help with mental health? Yeah. Has this been an area? Yes, coming up. But you know what? I'm going to direct that question to my esteemed colleague, Mark. I think he would be the right person to answer this question. <laughs> Dr. Andrew, thank you for <laughs> that, that's the, the power of being a you know, co-host. <laughs> Absolutely. You're always in doubt of that. Oh, well, thanks for the opportunity. And I'm really glad that the questions come up, um, not least because we've got um, Anthony Pinto here. He's um, also a great proponent of positive psychology. And as Dr. SK said, um, there's, there's always uh, an emphasis on trying to intervene at the latest possible stage, and not just when there's pathology, but actually a lot of the time with mental health, it's waiting to the stage at which things get to a real crisis. Uh, so investing in downstream and universal strategies to help people to be able to build their resilience, to recognize how they can live in a way that's going to nurture any mental health capacity they already have, um, and to mitigate any risks that are specific to them, because we're all different. We all, you know, we all suffer in, in similar ways, but we're all different. And getting to know yourself is a really essential part of building that resilience and that capacity. And we had a, an earlier webinar about recognizing signature strengths, which pertains to this. Um, so absolutely, uh, having an emphasis on this is, is going to have a, an effect on mental health individually, but also across our society, because as we're interconnected and the, the topic we're discussing today about families and friends and society, um, we're all interdependent for our mental health. And if you're struggling with something, the people around you, they're going to have that extra burden. And we have to be there for each other, but we also have to recognize that there's um, a, a knock-on effect. So the more we're able to bolster people with positive psychology strategies, um, the less the burden on the system and you end up with a virtual upward spiral the evidence certainly is there to show that by implementing these kinds of mental health, uh, positive psychology approaches, and the, the most promising and the, most, the best evidence of all of these is really about social connection, the simplest possible thing. So again, about people that we're talking about today, um, this is the way that you're more likely to nurture well-being, nurture happiness, and sort of um, fend off those risks to mental health. So yeah, um, we, we're all gonna struggle with mental health problems at some point in our life, but when we're not, when we're able to be strong and take care and through positive psychology approaches, then we're able to help those who are struggling at that time. We take turns helping one another and as a society, we're able to gradually sort of elevate the level um, and reduce the challenges that we're facing. Awesome, thank you so much, Dr. Mark. Yes, and... Um... That, that really highlights how we as people influence each other and we have that sort of impact with each other. And when you are able to take care of yourself and you're able to just start from within, then that you're also to extend it beyond ourselves. And that's really the centrality of today's whole discussion. Um, and we are really, really thankful for all your questions. There are so many great questions uh, and we apologize if we are not able to address any of them. Um, but feel free to continue to reach out to us or to any of our panelists if you like to. We'll be happy to assist you and to address your questions as well. So this marks the end of our session today. Once again, thank you so much to our co-hosts, Her Royal Highness Nungkubutri Iman Afsan and Dr. Uh, Dato Dr. Andrew. And of course, for our wonderful guest panelists, Dato Bindi, Dr. Kaur and Darren for sharing such wonderful pointers um, that gave us such insights to, into your respective fields and within our communities at large. Um, and of course, thank you to all our participants for joining and tuning in. We really appreciate your presence and your enthusiasm. Um, we truly hope that you enjoyed this session as well and you, you find it helpful. If you are interested in areas like these and if you want to know more about it, we have an upcoming webinar and we'll be releasing more details soon. So be sure to stay tuned on our social media pages or visit our website um, at mymindonfilm.my. And of course, thank you. yes, thank you so much, everyone. Do continue to share the word with your friends, your family, and um, as we say, let's keep the conversation going. All right, so if there are no further questions, 
we thank you once again for your participation. If you do have, have any questions at any point, feel free to reach out to My Mind on Film. Um, or if you have any questions for our panelists today, you may reach out to us and we'll direct them to our panelists as well. Thank you so much. Um, take care, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.